have not heard a bad word about Bobby Ryan in the course of this trial. His son, Robert Ryan Jr., said that he was a fantastic dad. Michelle Ryan said she was very close to her father. She used the word wow to describe her father. That's what he was in every sense of the word. Such a beautiful, loving man. He worked as a lorry driver with a local quarry in County Tipperary. Uh, he used to work very early, long hours, and he also worked as um, a part-time DJ, and he went by the name Mr. Moonlight, and that was where his passion, it seemed, lay. He wouldn't have any sort of old snobby stuff about being a DJ. He just wanted everybody to have a good time, anything from the Wolf Tones to ABBA, and whatever it took for them all to have a good time. But a lot of the time, what people were hiring was Bobby, because Bobby was the party. He really and truly was a tonic. You know, he'd never... He, he'd never hurt anyone. If you wanted anything, Moonlight, Bobby Ryan. So at 5.30, Bobby Ryan came home. Um, his son's partner, Leanne Hallisey, was staying there at the time with her daughter, Amy. Um, so Bobby Ryan spent a lot of time with them. He spent the evening with them. Uh, she described how he was down on the floor playing with his grandchild. Bobby Ryan, the night before, uh, was somewhat agitated by the amount of text messages that he was getting from uh, Mary Lowry. And he was showing these to his um, son's partner and asking her her opinion on them. At 9.30, he left the house and he asked uh, Leanne would she be OK? that he was going to go up to Mary to see what was wrong with her. I asked her what time did Bobby arrive to her house on the Thursday night. She said about half past ten. She said he was in great form, uh, that he was wearing a snazzy navy jumper and that he listened to music till one o'clock. Uh, she said he had a habit of leaving at half past six. He would go home to get his lunchbox, his boots, and then go to work in Killock Quarry. She said that she normally heard the sound of his van going across the cattle grid and that morning it took a little longer than usual to hear that. I said, did you notice anything after he left? And she said, yes. I was sat up in bed thinking, what the hell is keeping you from starting the van? And I said, how long was that? And she said it was at least five minutes, maybe seven, maybe even longer. Once he left Fonagown, he was never seen again. My brother Robert had rang me to say that um, you know he'd been to the to the quarry or whatever and daddy's van wasn't there so um, and if my, my first initial reaction was okay you know maybe he's taking the day off even though there was a bigger portion of me that said no way was he going to take the day off Bobby Ryan's daughter Michelle was the one who raised the alarm because he hadn't shown up for work and I suppose that went to his character too because he was a hard worker he was a good timekeeper he was never late well, here in the radio station, we got notification from the guardie that they needed some help in tracing a missing person. And that missing person was Bobby Ryan. And, I mean, that rang alarm bells with me. It wasn't the Bobby Ryan that I knew, and, of course, subsequently we found out that uh, it was. When Michelle Ryan was the one who reported her father as missing, she decided to go to Gardaí. She went down there with an aunt of hers, um, and she stepped out of the Garda station at one point, and her aunt did say to the Gardaí that Bobby Ryan had suffered from depression in the past and that she was concerned that he may have, have done something. Uh, Bobby Ryan, was his case was just being treated as a missing person investigation at this point. Michelle Ryan received a phone call from uh, Mary Lowry, who then offered to come out and meet her. When I was in Mary Lowry's car, I, I, had, I had asked her where was the, the woods from her house, what distance was it? And she said about a mile and a half, two miles. So I said, we need to go there to rule it out. We went, went, went there and I don't, I don't even think Mary Lowry's car was, was stopped when I, when I jumped out. And it was like I was running forever but it was only a short distance from where we drove in to where the van was. She said that she then ran into the woodland searching for her father, calling out uh, his name. And when she came back, Gardaí had then arrived uh, at the scene and she was speaking to a Garda and she asked for permission to go back into the van. A number of things didn't click with me, first of all. Number one, I was able to open the driver's door of the van. Daddy would have never have left his van and the way the seat was. You know, I, I knew what way the seat used to be positioned because when I used to get in to drive it after daddy, 
I never used to have to adjust it. But that day, when I got into it on the 3rd of June, the seat was back to the back. And she went out and told Gardaí that her father wasn't the last person had to drive that vehicle. As we searched, we became aware of a potential sighting at the Cardangan Road. We searched the whole areas there. We just continued searches. We searched empty buildings. He had vanished without a trace. There were extensive searches involving Garthi and members of the public of Bancher Woods, where his DJ van was found. It was mental torture. Was Daddy tied up? Was he trying to get to his phone? Was he hurt? You know, was he still alive? Like, these are everything. Like, I mean, for, for weeks on end, we were going through the woods, screaming his name. We were called in, in by Captain Costa. Bobby Ryan's uh, van, as you know, was found down here at the, in, the end of the passage. I suppose there was an element of maybe suicide uh, because the van was found not locked. So uh, not alone were you looking down, but you were looking up as well. You were searching for a phone, you were searching for car keys, you were searching for a shoe, any slightest bit of evidence at all to indicate that he was in here. But we found absolutely nothing. We were uh, confident, uh, very confident that our search was thorough, that we could confidently report back to Angada, know that there is nobody here. We would have been confident that we had searched every inch of, of the areas that we had designated ourselves. As Gardaí searched the farm at Fauna Gown, they did so with the help of Patrick Quirk, unaware that he and Mary Lowry had been having an affair. We heard when Gardaí searched the land at Fauna Gown, when Bobby Ryan was still a missing person, when Gardaí searched two slurry pits, Patrick Quirk was there to assist them and show them the pits. And when he was asked, were there any more tanks on the land? He said no, knowing full well that there was a third tank we heard from um, Martin Lowry's brothers, um, Jimmy and Johnny, who gave evidence at the trial to say that they recalled the, the, the runoff tank being constructed in the 1970s and asked who was aware of the existence. They said, you know, the two of them, Martin Lowry, obviously, and Pat Quirk. When Mary Lowry's husband, Martin, died in 2007, she was left with this huge farm that she had to take care of. She also had three little boys to look after. Mary Lowry said that she found it very difficult to cope, you know, on her own. Um, she said she didn't have any experience with accounts. Patrick Quirk stepped in with an offer to rent some of the farm from her and to manage her investments. Patrick Quirk is married to Imelda Lowry, whose brother was Martin Lowry, and Martin Lowry, we heard, was a very good friend of Patrick Quirk's. He described him as a best friend. The two of them became very close, and eventually the relationship became physical. In her testimony today, Mary Lowry said that the only explanation she could offer for this seedy affair was that she hadn't had a sexual relationship for many years because her husband had been sick. It is several weeks after Bobby's disappearance and search parties are still at work. As another search comes to an end, Catherine Costello receives a phone call from Mary Lowry. Well, it was becoming apparent that it wasn't suicide. Uh, there was nobody in the area. And it was after one search, it was about six, half past six in the evening, we'd walked all day when Mary Lowry called me asking, could she see me? I was actually in the garage at Bancher, a uh, carload of people had walked all day and when she pulled into the garage I got into her car and uh, she was very, very distressed um, to the point of hysteria. Days was now going into weeks and there was no sign of Bobby, so uh, it was a very different Mary Lowry. She apologised, said, I'm sorry I didn't tell you when I met you, uh, but I have been, I had an affair with my brother-in-law, uh, Pat Quirk. She was praying to her late husband for guidance, that's what she told me. She said the affair was wrong. She was having suspicions that what happened to Bobby could be foul play. Uh, Catherine Costello told her then at this point uh, that she had to tell Garthy about it because they were not aware of that piece of information. She balked about going to the guards. She said, how can I possibly walk into a counter and tell that to a guard? 
And when she realized that Mary Lowry hadn't in fact uh, contacted uh, Garthi, she decided to do so herself. And she brought that information uh, to Garthi. I phoned back the following night. I said, you better get somebody around to see her as a matter of urgency. Tell the officer that's dealing with the case to go around and see her as a matter of urgency. If we were asked to search the farm, I have no doubt in my mind we wouldn't be here today. That body would have been found that day. In late 2010, the sordid affair between Mary Lowry and Patrick Quirk is beginning to take its toll. She tried to end it a number of times, but she said he could be very controlling and manipulative. It began to fizzle out really because of guilt, I think. Um, and then when she met Bobby Ryan, I think that was a kind of a way for her to, you know, to finally kind of cut the cord between her and Pat Quirk. By his own admission, Patrick Quirk wasn't happy that the relationship had ended and it wasn't an amicable split. There was one day in particular when he had taken Mary Lowry's phone, he had gone through the text messages on it and he had found messages from Bobby Ryan. He took the phone and he texted Bobby Ryan from the phone saying, I'm the man. We heard that on the day that the body was discovered that Pat Quirk had decided that he would empty a slurry tank. He needed um, water to agitate the slurry. Now he did remember uh, this runoff tank near the milking parlour, this disused milking parlour. Uh, Bobby Ryan's body was at the bottom of that pit. We heard that he was lying um, uh, face down in at the bottom of the tank and his hands and his arms were by his side. His first instinct was to ring his wife Imelda. Um, so Imelda, he didn't want to say what had happened over the phone. Um, so she asked him, did he want to lift? And he said yes. Uh, his wife then went up and he told her what he thought he had just found in the tank. And she looked in and sure enough, uh, she felt that she had just uh, seen a body also. Gardy were first alerted to the discovery of the body when Garda Tom Neville got a phone call from Imelda Quirk. Now, there was some question why he didn't call Garthi first. Why did he call his wife? And he said that um, she just knew what to do in a crisis. He said he wasn't 100% sure it was a body and he wanted to get an opinion. And when he did, he said uh, that they contacted Garthi. Inspector Parag Powell was the first officer to the scene. And in court, he said when he got there, Imelda and Patrick were sitting on a wall on the property. He said that Patrick Quirk was extremely quiet that he noticed he was very clean, that his hands were clean and his clothes were clean, that he was very clean for someone who's supposed to be working with slurry that day. I was actually collecting my, my son from school and the phone rang and I answered it and he said, Michelle, he said there has been a body found on the, the Fawn Legowan farm. And I remember just, I heard nothing after that. I never even heard my, my son getting into the back of the car. I was just paralyzed. We, we wanted it for so long to get Daddy back. And um, that day came, that phone call came. And as broken as we were, that just took every last bit out of us. The detective superintendent said he looked inside the tank on April 30th, 2013 and couldn't see a body from standing position. He said that he knelt down and with a torch, he told the jury that with the aid of a clearer view, he believed that the person inside the tank was Bobby Ryan. The deputy state pathologist at the time was uh, Dr. Khalid Jabber. Um, when the Garthi rang Dr. Jabber to ask him to attend the scene, he declined. Um, so then the Garthi took their own decision to remove the body from the tank. They needed to take this second concrete slab off to allow the fire officers who had attended the scene uh, a better access to extract it. They did so with a mini digger. Um, a Garda was operating this particular digger and during the process of pulling back and taking off this concrete slab, we heard that it split and that some debris fell into the pit where Bobby Ryan's uh, body was lying below. They took the decision to, to go into the tank and to lever the remains onto a, a sheet of tarpaulin and then kind of ease that out of the tank. Uh, he was then placed in a body bag and he was taken away um, for a post-mortem which was conducted by the former state pathologist, uh, Dr. Kalib Jabber. The body of Bobby Ryan was found less than 100 yards from the place he was last seen alive. This raised questions about the Garthi's initial search and the handling of the missing persons inquiry. I mean, there, there was an element of shock to it, and particularly when people found out how close 
the site of the body was um, to to the house and again speculation as to why that wasn't searched. When we get a phone call in relation with the search there's one one question we ask of the person who rings us is that a PLS site place last seen? Of course everyone would like to start there. We wouldn't ask to search there uh, we were asked to eliminate the wood and that's what we've done. We don't know what level of searching was done. Uh, we can't question that because we don't know. Um, we were brought to search the wood here on that day. Um, so we did what we were asked to do. You know, the guard that you did face a number of criticisms um, by the defence, the failure to find Bobby Ryan um, in the initial search of Fauna Gown. However, the guard that you know, pointed out that they had relied on Pat Quirk, who had showed them around the farm, and they had relied on him to tell them of, of the existence of the tank. He told them there were two tanks on the farm. He didn't mention the other tank. If we were asked to search, search the farm, I have no doubt in my mind we wouldn't be here today. That body would have been found that day. I have no doubt in my mind that that would be the case. Any working farm is generally easy enough to, to search. Well, obviously, I presume a, a focus of yours would be to look for things that are hidden and to look for things that may not be there in plain sight, such as the runoff tank. Yes, exactly, exactly. Do you believe that that's something you as a farmer or other members of your group would have spotted? Yes, because any of us that are farming would be familiar with runoff tanks. If they had been allowed up, I do believe that myself and Robert wouldn't have happened to wait the 22 months to have our father back. The discovery hit Robert particularly hard. On the day Bobby went missing, he had gone to the farm looking for his father. Thinking back, I won't say I was that close, but I was, I was pretty close. I, I was, you know, I was just a down side of that, uh, of that uh, milk and parlour. And, uh, you know, it haunts me to this day. It haunts me to this day, trying to go to sleep every night. I'd be torn and tossing, screaming in bed waving hands. Every time I close my eyes, I actually think I'm in that black hole, scraping on them walls to get out. Because that's when, when Daddy was found, that's what I thought, that's, that's what Daddy was doing. Just, he was just thrown in there, hurt, and left to starve and die. Now upgraded to a murder investigation, Garthy once again turned to Patrick Quirk, this time looking into the man's personal life and his acrimonious split with Mary Lowry, which seemed to be turning into an obsession. We heard from his counsellor that he was very, very down about the breakup of his relationship with Mary Lowry. Um, he wasn't sleeping, and he had been prescribed um, medication, but that wasn't working. He was becoming quite, I think, obsessed and morose with the breakdown of the relationship, and he didn't seem to be able to get over that. And there was evidence heard during the trial as well about a letter that was sent in to an agony aunt who wrote for the Sunday Independent. The Dear Patricia letter painted him, I think, particularly in his own words as a man who was not in control. This was an anonymous letter, but it spoke about how this person was married, that he'd entered into an affair with somebody, that this affair had ended, and that this person had met somebody else, had moved on with their life. And he felt very let down because he felt that he had done a lot for this uh, particular person. Mary Lowry gave evidence of reading uh, this particular letter, and um, she suspected that it might have actually been penned uh, by Patrick Quirk, and she brought it to his attention, and Patrick Quirk did admit that he was the author of that letter and when asked why he had written it he said he'd no one else to turn to. The response to that letter was very interesting because um, Patricia Redlish um, basically told him to cop himself on that it was you know down to him to see how he would proceed from here. Jurors in the trial of Patrick Quirk have heard the accused told a social worker that Mary Larry had lost the run of herself after her relationship with Bobby Ryan started. The phone call to Tusla was kind of a very definite sign that Pat Quirk was on the edge. So we heard from a former social worker, Deirdre Caverly, via a video link from Boston. She told us of a phone call she had received in February the 4th, 2011, from a man who identified himself as Pat Quirk, um, raising concerns about Mary Lowry and her treatment of her children. He claimed that she was leaving them alone and unsupervised for long periods of time at night and that the wider paternal family were very concerned about this. It was investigated. Um, a social worker was sent to Mary Lowry's house and subsequently it was found that there was no cause for concern. This one act alone, I think, was enough to kind of paint Pat Quirk in a, in a very bad light, in a very vindictive light. 
she spoke of having had a break-in, uh, that the suspects had got in through a bathroom window, uh, there was nothing of value taken, uh, that Angarda had said it was possibly local use. Uh, she was now suspecting that it was Pat Quirk that had staged that break-in. Uh, she told me that she was taking particular security precautions. The alarm was activated around December of 2012 and Garthi were sent out to investigate and they concluded after the a visit that it was a false alarm. Mary Lowry asked one of her sons then to look back over the footage of that day. She said that she wasn't too familiar with how the system worked. Because of this, she discovered that Pat Quirk had been going up to her house on a regular basis, looking in the windows. That footage was shown uh, to the jurors and it showed Patrick Quirk wandering around the house, looking in windows, walking around the property. And then he goes into an area where we heard there was a clothesline. Mary Lowry claimed in her evidence that Patrick Quirk had taken uh, some underwear, some of her underwear off that clothesline. To steal keys, to intrude in your house, to frighten you, to stage break-ins. This is not somebody in love with you. It's not normal. She became very concerned and she decided then at that point that things had deteriorated to such a point that she felt it was time now to bring an early end to this lease. Patrick Quirk wanted compensation but eventually agreed uh, to leave the farm and he was due to do so uh, at the beginning of July of 2013 and it was a short time before that, April 30th of 2013, that he of course discovered the body of Bobby Ryan in this underground runoff tank beside a milking parlour on Mary Lowry's land. The CT scan showed the really extensive skull injuries. It was actually extremely poignant evidence, I thought, because it just showed the extent to which Bobby Ryan had been beaten. In 2013, and Patrick Quirk, only months away from being evicted from the farm at Fauna Gown, begins preparing for the inevitable discovery of Bobby Ryan's remains. His actions now will leave a trail of circumstantial evidence that will form the basis of his prosecution. And in 2017, following the seizure and search of a computer, Gardaí were confident they had sufficient evidence to charge Patrick Quirk with the murder of Bobby Ryan. I suppose an obstacle they had was that there was no direct link between Pat Quirk and Bobby Ryan. There was no DNA evidence found. There were no fingerprints found. There was nothing to actually bind the two together. We're all so... Um, so enamoured with CSI programmes nowadays and we watch them all of the time and we see these immediate results from DNA and we see these, these sort of immediate closure of investigation and stuff that we almost expect that to be applied um, to something like this and of course I mean one thing is fiction the other is reality. One of the first things the prosecuting barrister Michael Bowman said to the jurors was there was no smoking gun. They weren't going to be presented with blood-stained uh, clothing. There were no direct evidence, forensic or otherwise, uh, linking Patrick Quirk to the murder of Bobby Ryan. He said that all of the evidence against Mr Quirk would be circumstantial. The prosecution will seek to put a chain of circumstantial facts together and it's those circumstantial facts, each one in and of itself may not be sufficient to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt but when they're put together as a composite picture the argument that they're making is that there is only one possible outcome that the jury can come to and that is that the um, accused party um, is guilty of the crime. The jury were told that they would have to piece together the different strands of evidence to decide if Patrick Quirk had in fact murdered Bobby Ryan beyond all reasonable doubt. And what Michael Bowman also did was he speculated about Patrick Quirk's motive for killing a Bobby Ryan. Bobby Ryan was essentially a love rival and Michael Bowman suggested that Patrick Quirk felt he needed to get Bobby Ryan out of the picture, that he wanted to get back with Mary Lowry and he re reached a point where the only way he felt he could get him out of the picture was to murder him and to dump him in an underground pit. Unfortunately for Mary Lowry, they had to delve very, very deeply into her private life in a way that really does not happen in most trials. As the prosecution began presenting its case, it relied on several key pieces of evidence. The first and possibly the most contentious piece was the direct testimony of the woman at the centre of the love triangle, Mary Lowry.
There was a series of robust exchanges between Mary Lowry and um, the defence lawyers on, I think, her third day. She was cross-examined at length, as was Bernard Condon's right. She had his client's best interests at heart. But he was plucking what he felt were inconsistencies, and he accused her of telling inconsistencies. They basically tried to discredit her, you know, kind of said that she was out to paint Pat Quirk in a bad light in any opportunity that she could have. There was a point um, where she was being asked whether or not she had rekindled her relationship with Patrick Quirk after Bobby Ryan had went missing. And she said no. She said that he used to pester her and pressure her and he wanted to get back into a relationship with her. But she insisted that she didn't want anything to do with him. But she felt at one point that she was under such pressure that she did admit going away. They spent a night away in a hotel in Kalini in Dublin. And she said that she didn't remember an awful lot about it because she got very drunk. The only reason she went was so that he'd stop pestering her. She said they weren't intimate, absolutely not, when she was asked by Bernard Condon under cross-examination. If they had been, she said that they hadn't. She said that she didn't spend any other weekend with Patrick Quirk after Bobby Ryan went missing, aside from that weekend that she spent with him at a hotel in Kalini. Bernard Condon pressed her further and asked her if she'd ever stayed at the Cliff House Hotel in Ardmore, County Waterford. She said no, that she didn't recall uh, ever staying there. And then it was shown to her that there was a reservation uh, made uh, under the name of Patrick Quirk, but sent from um, an email address associated associated with Mary Lowry's name. When asked how could it be that there is a transaction to the Cliff House Hotel coming out of your bank account for the exact same amount for that stay around the same time. And she said that Patrick Quirk had access to her house and she put forward the proposition that perhaps he would have accessed her computer. And Bernard Condon was quick to point out that that was a wild theory. In any other murder trial, a vital piece of evidence is the body of the victim. In this case, however, even with the discovery of Bobby Ryan's remains, the prosecution were faced with a significant challenge. On the day the body was discovered, a call was put in to the state pathologist to get a pathologist to the scene. Dr. Kelly Jabber wasn't able to attend. And he was invited to come and give evidence about the post-mortem that he carried out the day after Bobby Ryan's body was discovered, but he declined that invitation. I think it would have been beneficial for the pathologist to have visited the scene, uh, seen the body in situ, and supervise the removal of the body uh, from the, the concrete pit. And, and certainly that's what I would have wanted to have done if, if I had been uh, involved in the case initially. If you don't go to the scene and you haven't assessed it, then if some other matter is raised, you may not be able to answer that. And I think there were issues that really couldn't be answered um, because of that failure of Dr. Jabber to attend. I think there is more that he, he could have done because of the limited examination, that then prevented me from perhaps being able to offer any further opinions, or perhaps more conclusive evidence in relation to how the injuries were sustained. Superintendent O'Callaghan was present when Dr. Jabber carried out an autopsy on the body of Bobby Ryan on May 1st, 2013, the day after it was removed from the runoff tank. The pathologist found multiple injuries consistent with an accident, traffic collision or a serious assault. Dr. Khalid Jabber's report was subsequently reviewed by a number of pathologists, um, including Dr. Jack Crane, who is the former Northern Ireland state pathologist. Professor Crane reviewed Dr. Jabber's post-mortem report and he agreed the cause of death was blunt force trauma. There's absolutely no doubt that he sustained very severe head injuries. Uh, there were very severe complex fractures of the, the skull and of the facial skeleton. Um, now, it was my view that the only tenable um, and credible explanation for those injuries was him having received a number of blows to the head um, from some form of blunt object. The, the difficulty was that because of the lapse of time, um, we weren't able to assess any surface injuries. There was no skin available for examination, which often gives you a clue as to what weapon or weapons might have been used. The evidence from um, the CT scan showed the, the really extensive skull injuries. Um, it was actually extremely poignant evidence, I thought, because it just showed the extent to which Bobby Ryan had, you know, had, had been beaten. 
However, the defence uh, produced their own pathologist, who is the acting state pathologist for here, um, Dr Michael Curtis. Jurors in the trial of Patrick Quirk have heard evidence from the deputy state pathologist who found the most likely cause of Bobby Ryan's death was due to a trauma from a vehicular impact. In his opinion, the mechanism of death was vehicular impact, or in other words, Mr Ryan had been struck by a moving vehicle. If one is struck by a motor vehicle, uh, maybe thrown into the air, thrown onto the ground, you will see a fracture um, or maybe a couple of fractures of the skull where the head impacts with the ground. Uh, to me, it's not credible that we have multiple skull fractures and fractures of the facial skeleton. Um, uh, that, to me, implies multiple impacts. Um, and so that, in my view, rules out this a simple uh, vehicular collision. The pathologist was, was really tough now. That was, that was something I don't want to ever say true again. Um, having to listen to your dad's injuries. Um, you know, day in, day out. You close your eyes for a second and hope you'd wake up and this is not happening to you. There was um, a, a big break, you know, on, on, on his, his, his thigh bone. Was that the first one? Did he feel the rest? Like, we have no answers and there's no, there's no way of anyone to tell us that he didn't, he didn't feel it. He was gone before the rest happened. We, we don't know. Apart from the physical injuries found during the post-mortem, the body of Bobby Ryan yielded another significant piece of evidence. Dr. Khalib Jabber um, preserved a maggot that was found on Bobby Ryan's body and he took that away for further analysis. Dr. John Manlove, a forensic scientist who specialises in the study of insects, had been contacted by Gardaí in 2014. He gave various details about what type of insects are attracted to a particular chemical that is released by the body post-mortem. Using a single insect larva taken from Bobby Ryan's body during the post-mortem, he identified the common blowfly. What his evidence was with these particular flies, in his opinion, were at a stage of growth that suggested that the pit was opened sometime in the weeks before Bobby Ryan's body was found by the accused. It was a really big day in court and it was a really significant piece of evidence because it demonstrated to the jury that somebody had opened that tank prior to April 30th, 2013. It went hand in hand with the prosecution case that Mr Quirk had staged the scene. But did Patrick Quirk have time to stage the scene? The testimony of another witness held the answer. We heard from Brida O'Dwyer, the AI technician, her evidence was very central, I think, to this trial when she placed Pat Quirk in his own milking parlour at Branch Moor, still milking at 9.30 at a time when he would normally have been washed up, had the place spotless and on his way to breakfast. That was critical in terms of suddenly a window of opportunity opened up here. Pat Quirk's alibi fell away and all of a sudden, where was Pat Quirk on the morning? Patrick Quirk was the person who had access to that tank. He was the person who had the opportunity to open it and he was the person who had a motive to kill Bobby Ryan. The evidence of Dr. Manlove raised the question of why the tank was opened in the weeks prior to the discovery. The answer was found during the search of a computer. The dead went before the jury. You could see from their faces that this was very, very significant. It was a hugely damning day in court. And many people w will say that that was the day in court that Patrick Quirk was convicted. The prosecution in the trial of Patrick Quirk had very early on stated that there was no smoking gun, but on the 22nd of March, the state presented the next best thing, the search history of a computer seized from Patrick Quirk's home. The day of the computer evidence went before the jury it was a hugely significant day. The prosecution had been building toward this for a long time. The jury in the trial of Patrick Quirk has heard a computer seized in his house contained Google searches for human body decomposition. The issue was the amount of searches, the period of time over which all this searching was done. Um, the material which was being viewed was of a very similar nature grisly nature and that whoever was conducting these searches had taken a very keen interest in human decomposition. 
Forensic analysis of the computer's hard drive also found links to YouTube videos which appeared as images, but Gardaí could not verify if those videos had been watched. These included a link to a YouTube channel called The Body Farm and Beyond, which takes you on a tour showing and discussing human remains, skin slippage and DNA analysis. I mean, it's not something I think that most people would search on their computer, you know, how does a bo human body decompose, what stage is it at, you know, a week after the death, two months after the death, you know, two years after the death. Gardaí arrested Mr Quirk on a charge of murder. He was taken in for questioning and this is when they put all the material that had been found on the computer to him. They put it to him that he had searched for hu human decomposition on his on his home computer and they asked him why. Um, he said to them, my son had recently died, that's all I'm going to say. They sympathised with him, but then they came back to it and they said to him that actually one of the searches had been conducted in July 2012, which was a month before his son had died. He didn't really seem to know what to say to that. The dead went before the jury you could see from their faces that this was very, very significant. It was a hugely damning day in court. And many people will say that that was the day in court that Patrick Quirk was convicted. The computer held even more evidence, but after fierce opposition from the defense, it was deemed inadmissible. Among the material from the computer that had been excluded were searches to do with the Joe Riley case and the Siobhan Carney case. The user had viewed an article titled How Joe Riley Committed the Perfect Murder. There were a number of audio clips that were excluded from the evidence. They didn't go before the jury and Judge Creedon ruled them inadmissible. She said that they were more prejudicial than probative and that they pointed to the strange sexual proclivities of Mr Quirk. These audio clips consisted of Patrick Quirk and Mary Larry engaged in sexual activities. The same search of Patrick Quirk's home that yielded the computer evidence also uncovered a note. Some text was clearly legible and seemed to be an attempt by Patrick Quirk to point the finger of suspicion at Mary Lowry. I think the note that he left in the study was, was very much a deliberate plant. Um, it, it, it appeared on the surface to be, you know, his musings of how on earth did this happen? You know, how did Mary, why was Mary so confused about, you know, how long it had taken Bobby Ryan to leave the yard that day? You know, how did she find the van so quick? It appeared to be kind of a list of questions that showed that Pat Quirk was trying to solve this murder mystery on his own. But using an electrostatic detection apparatus, Gardaí found the indentations of more text left from a previous page in the notebook. But then the secret indentations revealed a very different picture. There was a handwriting expert who gave evidence and he was asked to examine this particular document. We heard from Dr Jeremiah Maloney, who was a handwriting expert at the Garda Technical Bureau. He told the trial how he had used a device to read the indentations from previous handwritings. And that was quite explosive, actually, that point in the trial. Um, he found what the guards will know, um, dispose of phone, keys, clothes. Body murdered, possibly in house. There was reference to body being naked. And these were a number of words that were found as indentations on the paper. Throughout the trial, Patrick Quirk's demeanor was mostly the same. He was very stoic, very expressionless. There was one day in particular when that mask seemed to slip, and that was the day that Jack Lowry gave evidence in court. Jack Lowry, Mary Lowry's middle son, came in to give evidence. Again, Pat Quirk didn't look at him as he entered the room. The prosecution asked Jack, you know, what, what he had made of Pat Quirk, and Jack Lowry said that he had no problem with Pat Quirk, and he painted this picture of how he had spent a lot of time with him on the farm, with his son, um, Alan, who had passed away tragically in the farm accident. And he'd gone back in time, he was talking about a time in Fonagown when they were children and they were playing on the farm, himself and Alan and Patrick Quirk, and it was very clear that there was some kind of bond had formed between the three of them. And the reaction from Pat Quirk to this was actually quite extraordinary. Patrick Quirk became very, very emotional. His lips were trembling. He was clearly fighting back tears. And for the first time during the trial, you really saw some sort of sense that he had actual emotions.
at Bobby's funeral, uh, he, his daughter, Michelle, spoke so eloquently uh, about her father and spoke about that profound sadness and also spoke about the need for justice as well and that uh, somebody should pay a price for the death of uh, her father. Michelle Ryan addressed the congregation and said, you know, God didn't take daddy from us. Somebody else who was playing God did that. I just jumped up out of my seat and went over and I, I grabbed the coffin and I hugged the coffin. It seemed to just four screws. I wanted to just unscrew them. And regardless of what was facing me in there, I just wanted to hold it, do you know what I mean? Um, I wanted daddy back. There was nothing else going to do me. There was nothing else going to do me. There was a brown box. But what was inside in that brown box, I wanted it. But it belonged to us, it belonged to me, do you know what I mean? It wasn't just daddy, it was, it was my best friend. He was, he was a granddad. You know, he was, he was our world. He was the life and soul like of, of everything. The jury began its deliberations at 2 p.m. yesterday. They returned just over an hour later, requesting a transcript of all of the Garda interviews with the accused, Patrick Quirk, and requesting phone records submitted in evidence. The jury have two verdicts open to them in this case. They can find Patrick Quirk guilty of murder, or they can acquit. At the end of the day, the most important thing here was that Patrick Quirk, a 50-year-old farmer, was sitting in the dock accused of the most serious crime that anybody can be accused of in this country. And the only people who really mattered when you think about it was the 12 men and women of the jury who ultimately had to decide his fate. Every, every minute that went past was, was pain. Not knowing the 12 strangers, will they come back? Were they guilty or not guilty? It's, um, yeah, it's, it's something I, I never want to see through again. Patrick Quirk arrived at the Central Criminal Court this morning accompanied by his wife Imelda, his last morning as a free man and as an innocent man in the eyes of the law. It was very tense in courtroom 13 as the accused Patrick Quirk sat in the dock and the foreman of the jury read out the verdict, finding him guilty of Bobby Ryan's murder by a majority verdict of 10 to 2. The Ryan family had their hands wrapped around one another and they were emotional upon hearing this. We got justice for Daddy today. It will never bring him back, but we hope now that he is at rest. We would also like to thank the members of the public for all their continued support and kind words that they have given us throughout this ordeal and one of the hardest times of our life. There was a weight lifted. There was a weight lifted after, after getting that. But at the end of the day, Daddy's gone. I won't bring him back. He was one in a meal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> our world is just, our world is gone. You know, Patrick Quark left us with nothing. We can't look forward to anything because the whole room could be full. But the one person that we want there you know, isn't. The last time I was with him, he was playing down below Pat Foxes. It was like somebody up there was telling us, this is going to be your last time together. You're never going to have another night like this. You know, and it just rolled all the years into one. And um, he put on Tina Turner, Proud Mary. And he was there from Manchelli to sing the song. And um, I did. And his, his two jaws they just lit up and the tears were coming out his eyes laughing. from laughing and that was the last time that i was ever ever going to dance for daddy or sing with him again the following friday he was gone yeah